Yes, a nuclear bomb went off within the sub, and yes, that's how the Animorphs will end up in the time of the dinosaurs. Because, you see, nuclear power is a magical force that only wizards can master. But before we can get into that, we need to discuss this here bomb. I want to make this very clear to you. A nuclear bomb just went off! This is the most serious, most game-changing, non yerk related event to happen in the entire series, and it's never brought up again! Do you have any idea what impact a nuclear explosion would have on the Animorphs' hometown? Let alone the world? To give you some idea, here's a scene from the second season of 24, in which the evil Turtle Man explains what would happen if such a thing occurred. In the time available, the plane can get roughly 80 miles offshore. If it splashes down a few minutes before detonation, the bomb will go off underwater. The ocean will absorb a large portion of the radiation. However, prevailing winds would blow a moderate level of fallout back over the city of Los Angeles. Over time, there would be a high incidence of cancer and other radiation-related diseases. But at least there'll be no immediate casualty. We can't be certain, Mr. President. The shipping lanes into the port of Los Angeles are extremely busy. In the 80 square miles off the coast of L.A., the Coast Guard counts some two dozen freighters flying flags from around the world, plus an unknown number of unregistered fishing or pleasure vessels. It's likely that one or more of them will be sunk or capsized by the effect of the blast. What's the impact on the environment? The blast will wipe out a substantial pocket of biodiversity. Keystone species would be exterminated. The food chain would be contaminated, and the regional ecological infrastructure would collapse. Marine resources such as offshore drilling, commercial fishing, even recreational beach usage would become hazardous or impossible for many years. The ecological and economic effects, Mr. President, would be devastating. Yeah, this kind of thing really can't be taken lightly. At the very least, the beaches should close permanently, but even more likely there should be a partial evacuation of the city until damages can be properly assessed. But none of that happens! The explosion is completely forgotten! This is far worse than forgetting about the oatmeal barrel exploding in the yerk pool. There are books coming up that should be impossible because of this event. Though I might have been able to throw this book a bone if it meant no Animorphs Go to Atlantis stories. I, I can't emphasize this enough. This should be the BP oil spill times, like, a hundred. It would revise talks about nuclear regulation. There would be massive anti-nuclear protests in Washington, D.C. The military would probably refigure how they manage their submarines. And think of the possibilities that might offer the Yerks infest politicians and play on this red button issue and try to gain favor in the upcoming presidential election everyone's always talking about. And think of the promotion this might give the sharing, whose base of operations was in the city that got affected by the accidental nuclear blast. Have the sharing lead these same anti-nuclear protests. They'd scoop up new hosts by the truckload. This is more important than the Animorphs going to meet the dinosaurs. Okay, so the Animorphs awaken in the ocean, still in their dolphin morphs. They regroup and try to figure out what the hell just happened. They look towards land and are shocked to discover that where the city should be, there's instead a volcano. Rachel narrates, Something is way wrong here, I said. Volcanoes just don't suddenly erupt. Besides, look how high that thing is. That takes hundreds of years of lava and ash building up. How do you know anything about volcanoes? Jake demanded. Did we do volcanoes in school? Wait, Jake demanded. No, hey, hang on, let me redo that. <clears throat> How do you know anything about volcanoes? Jake demanded. <laughs> Jesus, who hadn't learned about volcanoes by junior high? All I remember about elementary school was making like a bajillion baking soda and vinegar volcanoes. I'm sure Rachel probably picked up on the fact that volcanoes don't spring out of nothingness somewhere along the lines. But no, actually Rachel confesses that her unexpected encyclopedic knowledge of volcanoes comes from watching the magic school bus. Oh, I remember that episode. <laughs> I like being erupted. I'm sure you do, Phoebe. Oh, and as a side note, Scholastics owns the magic school bus property. Just saying. Before Rachel can spout more of the wisdom of Miss Frizzle, they suddenly realize that two whale-shaped long neck monsters are approaching them rather quickly. Tobias quickly recognizes them as the Lasmosaurus they are. Well, the... Lasmosaurus, if it was capable of lifting its head like the Loch Ness Monster, which, for the record, they can't. 
Rachel's instinct is to stay and fight these creatures off, which causes Tobias to think this to himself. I liked Rachel even before I became a hawk, but now I really like her. She could be a bird of prey. She'd be a natural. You know, I'm starting to think that Tobias has become a foul sexual. Anyway, the two Lasmosaurus quickly gain on the dolphins. Another thing scientists don't believe these creatures would have been capable of doing, but that doesn't matter because in their hurry they fail to notice the large Chronosaurus ahead of them, and before you can say, I like being erupted, both Tobias and Rachel are swallowed whole by the Chronosaurus. Tobias and Rachel demorph inside the creature, but get bashed around by a large gizzard stone. The book makes it seem like they're being ground down by one giant rock, when instead dinosaurs that use gizzard stones would have swallowed many gravel-sized rocks. But I can give them the benefit of the doubt in confusing a lot of smaller stones bunched up together as one big stone. This is where the book gets a bit difficult to review, because now the Animorphs are split into two groups. Now, like all the Megamorph books, each chapter is narrated by a different Animorph. Now, Megamorph won the Andalite's Gift, each chapter flow more or less in chronological order, even when jumping to a completely different setting. This is not the case with Megamorphs 2, which keeps jumping backwards and forwards in the timeline to cover both groups. For the sake of my sanity, I'll just refer to the events as they happen in the book as opposed to their actual chronological order. So, having just seen two of their numbers get eaten by a giant aquatic lizard, the rest of the Animorphs manage to outmaneuver the monsters, but not before Marco and X have to drag Cassie's ass out of harm's way because she has to stay in one spot and yell Rachel's name a whole bunch of times. Because, you see, Cassie is a moron. Finally, the Animorphs reach shore and demorph. X morphs human because, as far as he knows, humans are still around. Of course, there are no humans around, and that means no city and no highly irradiated boardwalk. Jake's mind, of course, is on Rachel and Tobias. Jake narrates. I had gotten Tobias and Rachel killed. If only I had been watching ahead instead of looking behind, I could have seen the threat coming. I should have had everyone morph to shark. Then we could have fought. Watching ahead instead of looking behind? What does that even mean? On one side is an island, and on the other side are monsters from the past. What exactly qualifies as ahead and behind in this situation? If anything, I'd be heading towards land, making that ahead, which is exactly where you were looking. Yeah, I know, I'm nitpicking, but I earned it, damn it. The four Animorphs begin to investigate their surrounding, coming across many bird-like footprints and a bunch of broken trees with their leaves stripped. Marco suspects it was a tornado, but Axe, being the only competent one in this book, points out the rather large footprints around the tree. Jake narrates. I looked down. It could have been the footprints of an elephant except that the toes were more like claws. Plus, the print sank at least six inches into the sand. And, oh yes, it was about four feet across. Oh, so, uh, <laughs> not at all like the footprint of an elephant. Cassie narrates. Jake looked at me. Cassie, do you know anything that could possibly have this footprint? <laughs> Jake thinks I'm some kind of animal expert. Well, gee, I wonder if that's because you live on a farm, and both of your parents are vets, and one of them works at a zoo, and you have an overwhelmingly stated love of animals. Yeah, you know, that's probably it, Cassie. How foolish of Jake to assume that you know more about animals than anyone else on the team because of those reasons. He clearly should have asked Marco, who plays video games for a living. Stop whining and answer the man's goddamn question! Well, despite her obnoxious reservations towards being the most knowledgeable about animals in the group, Cassie closely examines the trees and footprints and comes to a conclusion. <laughs> Beats the fuck out of her. So, with nothing to go on, the Animorphs head into the forest in search of civilization. They stop by a stream to take a drink, but almost get their heads bitten off by a giant-ass crocodile. Cassie narrates. That wasn't right, I gasped. Yeah, no kidding, Marco said. No, I mean it was too big. The jaw was too long and thin. <laughs> yeah, Jake was totally foolish to think you were some kind of animal expert, Cassie. Oh. Axe, being the only competent one in this book, decides that it might be wise to morph back to Andalite so he can actually defend himself from the various monsters running around. Realizing that Cassie is both out of her element and a whiny bitch, Jake turns his attention to Axe. Let's try it another way. Axe, you know more about physics and so on than any of us. <laughs> Jake thinks I'm some kind of physics expert. 
Axe confirms that no explosion could safely dump them to any exotic location, and Jake just throws his hands up in frustration. But it's sunny now, it's not overcast. I thought Jake's emotions were directly connected to the weather. So the Animorphs wander around a bit until they just kind of accidentally find a baby saltosaurus. And I swear to God, I hope there's such a thing as a pepperosaurus. Before they can really register what they are seeing, a Tyrannosaurus leaps out from behind them and takes the Saltosaurus out. Meanwhile, in the past... I think we spent so much time away from Rachel and Tobias to heighten the suspension and make us question their demise, but come on, we know they're going to get out of this. I mean, seriously, Rachel dying? Oh, give me a break. So we cut back to Rachel and Tobias inside the lizard tummy, where Rachel manages to morph Grizzly Bear and punch through the stomach and puncture the creature's lung, allowing air to enter the stomach and prevent them from suffocating. Rachel starts to dig through the beast in what is basically the chestburster scene from Alien from the chestburster's point of view. Thankfully, the Chronosaurus beaches. Unlike the other four Animorphs who took over an hour to run into an actual Jurassic Park-style dinosaur, Rachel and Tobias are more or less dumped right into the middle of a hydrosaur herd. Tobias is pretty fucked up with a broken wing, so he morphs human and then morphs back to hawk, since morphing heals all injuries, except this time, his wing remains broken. Dun dun dun! Okay, the hell? How does that make any sense? Jumping ahead here a bit, the Animorphs travel through time due to a serial rip, the same event that caused them to travel through time in number 11, The Forgotten, a book in which the Animorphs ran around the rainforest in their skivvies, which you know had to have resulted in a skin knee or a minor cut or, you know, getting chunks taken out of you by killer ants. But at no time in that book did anyone notice that their injuries weren't healing, so chances are time travel has nothing to do with Tobias not being able to heal from morphing. Tobias actually makes an interesting observation, that perhaps the Elemist gave him faulty morphing abilities, which might go to explain why the dolphin Tobias was acquiring in number 15 Escape didn't go into a trance. That gives me the funny image of the Elemist stopping by the local metaphysical Goodwill to pick up some used morphing powers and a sweater for his grandma's birthday. Metaphysical Goodwill is probably where Dealing Dan Hawk now works after Rachel stomped all over his cars. No, actually, the real reason Tobias' morphing powers aren't working correctly is because, if they were, Tobias could fly high, locate the other Animorphs in two minutes, and the two groups could get back together with no problem or conflict. It'd be too easy. So Kay Applegate decided to break her own established rules for the sake of bullshit drama. Thanks a bunch, K.A. So instead of morphing human for an hour and a half at a time and not slowing them down as they go look for the rest of the Animorphs, Tobias decides he needs to stay Hawk in order to heal making him totally useless and a burden to Rachel. Rachel tears a strip from her morphing outfit, because the last thing she needs is as much coverage from the elements as possible, and makes a crude splint. <laughs>